Today, we're sharing a special episode from the Moment of Zen podcast, which Eric co-hosts with Antonio Garcia Martinez, founder of Web3 growth metrics company Spindle, and Dan Romero, founder of Farcaster, a sufficiently decentralized social network. The guests for this episode were Amjad Massad, CEO of Replit, a leader in AI coding assistance with its Ghostwriter and Ghostwriter chat products, Flo Crivello, founder of Teamflow, and myself. We cut the original hour and a half discussion down to the parts that focus exclusively on AI. So in the next 30 minutes, you'll hear a mix of visionary and skeptical takes on short and midterm AI impacts. From the potential rise of the 1000x developer to the question of what makes this AI moment different from previous hype cycles, to analysis of which types of AI companies will prove enduring, this is a fast-paced, wide-ranging discussion among some very smart people, all of whom are grappling with AI developments in real time. Enjoy. The level of exponential improvement is so tight that like, you could go to lunch and come back and the world has changed, right? So that's a singularity because you can't know what's next. And then the sort of the laser branch of that view is that, is that the most likely outcome is death of the humanity. And the reason that's most likely outcome is because it is impossible to align a enormous computing force that at the same time is sort of dumb. It doesn't understand sort of human preferences. And therefore, any goal that you give it is not going to be specific enough. And uh, there are a lot of uh, potential sort of attribution uh, or explanation of that goal that that gets you in trouble. Yeah, I call bullshit. I think they're completely fucking full of it. <laughs> Sorry. You know how like in a lot of the uh, like the sci-fi apocalypse literature that appeals to nerds, like somehow when literally the fucking world ends and there's no law and order and it's Mad Max, the guys who make the computers work somehow end up running the show. This is an expression of that fantasy. The Cognitive Revolution podcast is supported by OmniKey. OmniKey is an omni-channel creative generation platform that lets you launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with the click of a button. OmniKey combines generative AI and real-time advertising data to generate personalized experiences at scale. I think we're going to see a great convergence of a lot of different AI advances that suddenly all come together and really make a tremendous impact on modern life. And so calling it the cognitive revolution, because I think the changes that we'll see are going to be every bit as transformative as what we saw. We weren't here to see it, but as our ancestors saw in the agricultural revolution and of course the industrial revolution. Yeah, I totally agree that everything is and said. Uh, I was grabbing dinner um, last night with Daniel Aristotle, who described what we're going through as what he calls the sealed the great convergence. So he says, you know, the first one was 2012 with like the image that moment and deep learning uh, and all of AI turned into that. Uh, the second one was Transformers with the uh, attention is all you need paper in 2017. And then we're going through the third one since, you know, roughly 2022, you could think of those convergences as happening once every five years with large language models. So large language models, you know, chat GPT is the most famous example. They're really good at manipulating languages, like language, like really, really, really good. It just turns out that they're so good at it that uh, the moment you model out any task as a language task, which turns out you can model a lot of tasks with a language task, uh, it becomes really good at that as well. So we're starting to use large language models for things ranging from, obviously you can ask it questions, but it can also do a little bit of math. You, you know, we're starting to use it as a search engine. We're starting to use it to code. We're starting to use it in robotics as a sort of reasoning engine. And so I think that like that alone makes AI dramatically underhyped. And I say that knowing full well how hyped it is. Uh, I think even if we stop the progress and the discoveries that we've made right now, which we're not stopping, they're going exponential. Even if we stop them right now, all of civilization, I think, is going to be dramatically impacted in the next 10 years. And then I think zooming out even further, yeah, I am, I am more and more a believer of, you know, the uh, AGI moment. My, my timelines are compressing rapidly, uh, meaning I actually believe that AGI is going to happen uh, sooner and sooner, and my concerns are slowly increasing. Um, so, you know, as a reminder of that, what AGI is, it's, you know, that uh, recursive loop of self-improvement, AGI become better and better, and so it ends up with an idea of one trillion. Um, I think that the steel man for it is that, um, you know, we, we, and the reason why people are so worried is that Moore's law means that there won't be just one AGI. Moore's law means there will be a lot of AGIs. 
And so in the limit, anyone with a laptop has an AGI. And now the, the risk that uh, Elie Zeliot uh, talks about is that it's impossible to align a single AGI, let alone a million AGIs. So we need to align it. We need to do that impossible thing a million times. Anyway, that's not to say that I think like uh, we should like burn all the GPUs or whatnot, which I think is, is uh, what uh, Yudkovsky may prescribe. I, I just think it, it is something that is under discussed. I think it is a real risk. And I, I, I just wish there was a lot more funding and attention brought to this issue. Yeah, so the, the steel man of, of the flow side of the argument, which is essentially like, I think Eliezer Yudkowsky is like the big, like the major sort of authority there. And then a lot of, now there's another guy, Paul Cristiano, who's like an offshoot of uh, Les Wrong or the Ezra Yudkowsky. But that sort of branch of AGI is going to kill us all is was started by Eliezer. And the sort of main argument there is that if you accept the secular view that you know humans uh, have these meat computers, then there's no fundamental physical law that says you can't build these meat computers in 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 sort of Turing machines, right? So if you accept that, then you also accept that at some point we're going to have human level AI. If you accept that that we're going to have human level AI, you also have to accept that there's going to be an AI explosion. So an AI takeoff event is basically when the AI comes online and um, trains the next generation of AI, and that na- next generation of AI creates the next generation of AI, and that could start like a slow process over a year or two. Actually, like you know, people at OpenAI are already using GPT-4 to train GPT-5, right? <laughs> and so uh, that's already in some way happening, and that will shorten to milliseconds at some point. And that's the Ray Kurzweil's singularity, right? Where the level of exponential improvement is so tight that like you could go to lunch and come back and the world has changed, right? So that's a singularity because you can't know what's next. And then the sort of the laser branch of that view is that is that the most likely outcome is death of humanity. And the reason that's most likely outcome is because it is impossible to align a enormous computing force that at the same time is sort of dumb. It doesn't understand sort of human preferences. And therefore, any goal that you give it is not going to be specific enough. And uh, there are a lot of potential sort of attribution uh, or explanation of that goal that that gets you in trouble. Yeah, I call bullshit. I think they're completely fucking full of it. <laughs> Sorry. You know how it, like in a lot of the like the sci-fi apocalypse literature that appeals to nerds, like somehow when literally the fucking world ends and there's no law and order and it's Mad Max, the guys who make the computers work somehow end up running the show. This is an expression of that fantasy, right? That n- never mind like the weird Western obsession, like the original robot was coined in a, in a, in a play in which the robots took over or the Gollum legend in San Jewish folklore in which humanity creates a thing and that thing rebels. There's always been this deep latent thing that that's going to happen, but I think it's basically bullshit. And not only that, the transhumanism is also bullshit. You literally take any of little Kurzweil's little spiels and like global reg X, like replace singularity with rapture and you get an evangelical sermon. It's basically Christian eschatology expressed in scientific form. They're just not aware of it because they don't actually read any religion. That, that's what I think it is. And I, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I, I don't doubt that the house cat theory though, i.e. that like HG Wells time machine thing where like you have the Eloy and the Morlocks. And it turns out we just become Eloy in which we're living on the surface of it. And the Morlocks are like machines or something else. Maybe that happens. I think that's already happened in the sense that we get worked up about these Twitter fights over nothing in which nothing happens. I think fundamentally, like people ascribe agency to, to things like, you know, anyone who has kids knows that like one of the first things that kids do when they grow cognitively is they try, they give, um, and names and they give personalities to their toys or even to like simple things like boxes or whatever. Humans have this tendency to ascribe agency. I, I think people just extrapolate from this idea that we see some kind of glimpses of agency in these things to the fact that these things can formulate abstract goals and desires and go execute on them, which I don't think is entirely true, right? So. The AI is ultimately a tool 
for humans to do things in the world, right? It's another, like, I, I think of LLMs are uh, as another computer. That's how I kind of build on top of LLMs. And we're doing a lot of things with LLMs at Replit. It's my mental model for it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a computer, right? And it's, it's a very powerful new type of computer. Let's have the intellectual honesty to say that we do not understand what consciousness is and we don't understand the thing that really gives us agency. But I think it's just a tool as, as it were right now. I think we need some kind of science of agency of consciousness before we're able to say that we can build these things to recruit enormous amount of value in the world requires a lot of planning, a lot of emotions. A lot. Just think about being an entrepreneur. You've done it multiple times. Just like how much convincing you have to do, uh, you have to have a, some kind of theory of mind. You have to think what other people think, and I'm not sure we can build that just yet. So no AI girlfriends, it, like you don't. Think it that's will a... look like it. It yeah. might act like it. It might fool some people. ChatGPT is already fooling some people, but that doesn't make it it, and that doesn't get it to the level of power that kills us all. What the transformer model brought um, is a kind of generality. So in a way, there's a generality jump here. Um, I, I think if you if you go back to um, the early uh, era of AI, they would they would probably think that the large language models that we have today are some kind of AGI, because you know it's a, sort of this uh, boiling fragment phenomena where like slowly we're increasing generality. There's no, not going to be any point of time we're going to say, "Ha, this is AGI." Um, I, I, I think uh, you know every jump is going to be like a significant jump in generality, but it's still going to feel somewhat slow. So this this creates a sort of a rising tide, and uh, you know makes everyone more productive, makes uh, software a lot easier to create. Um, creating software used to mean learning all sorts of arcane knowledge and now you just have to write english to create a piece of software you can create a meaningful piece of software so now you take something that was the capability of expert software engineers and you give it to everyone in the world and i think the impact of that is going to be a hugely deflationary b is going to like give people new superpowers i think new type of entrepreneurship is on the rise and we're seeing a lot of people that would have required companies and armies of people around them to build something useful are able to do it on their own. And I think we're going to see a new crop of winners and entrepreneurs and and sort of millionaires and billionaires coming out of uh, uh, this phenomena. And so, and, and it's it's also like a fundamentally new way of of working and and automating things. So would would you teach your kids to code? Yeah, I would teach my kids to code, and the reason is. Because code is still going to be super relevant, we have ways to generate more accurate code. We're gonna we're coming up with a Chat GPT like thing inside Replit, and that uses a larger model and will give you more accurate code. But still, the accuracy is not gonna be hundred percent. So you need to learn how to debug that code. I think surprisingly, most programmers will spend most of their time reading and understanding code. Um, that's gonna put pressure on tooling for for debugging and comprehension and llms will help there llms can explain code for you but i think there's going to be more innovation and in visualizing code and, you know other ways uh, to debug and comprehend code on the front end side of things you're going to see super productive front end coders that are heavily powered by code generation. Like it might be the case that they don't actually code. They're actually just like plumbing things together. They're talking to all of the, a lot of different LLMs. They're uh, they're acting more like project managers and product managers than actual programmers. Uh, on a recent podcast, I called this the Steve Jobs black pill. In the early vision of, of, of computing, uh, we thought that everyone was going to be a programmer. Right. There wasn't this user programmer dichotomy. And then like you know, Steve Jobs popularized end user, the idea of end users with user interfaces, really lovely user interfaces. And that became the dominant thing. And most people are consumers of software as opposed to the creators. I think the idea of software creation will come back. 
I think there's going to be a lot more people wanting to create, uh, you know, personal software and software for their business use case. And there's going to be a lot of end user programming. Those people will not will not have to read code because the the level of accuracy needed is probably not hundred uh, percent. Optimization needed is not like performance needs is not that high. A lot of the code is going to th- be throwaway code. And so if you're like a you know professional. You, you probably don't have to learn to code. Uh, but if you want to be sort of a low level programmer, I think that's still going to be relevant. Or if you want to be a front end engineer, you, you need to have some knowledge of code, but maybe not that deep. It feels like it's, it's going to make the 10x engineer a 100x engineer in the sense that there's still a base level of you need to be able to guide it in the right direction. It's a tool. And so for the person who already has the skill level or the talent, it, it's going to be a, a, you know, increasing the advantage. Whereas for maybe the mediocre engineer, it doesn't really make a huge difference and, or maybe they just lose their job completely. Like I'd be curious how you guys think about that. I think of it as a, as a, as a rising tide lifting all boats. So I agree. I think like the 10X engineer is going to become a 100X engineer. I think the 1X engineer may become a 10X engineer. And I think to answer your question earlier, like GM, about is that a, a new step change? I think folks who were not engineers before will become engineers and be able to perform simple tasks at first and more and more complicated ones. I don't think this is like a replacement dynamic, but it's also really worth looking into Anthropic's recent publication that they're calling Constitution AI. And it's kind of the next generation of reinforcement learning from human feedback. They're now doing reinforcement learning from AI feedback. I think it's interesting also figuring out, I'm not sure whether uh, AI is going to replace the code, like we're going to run models instead of running code, or whether it's going to write the code. Um, I, I do agree with Amjad that these models have a weakness right now, which is that they, they suck at systematic thinking. So for example, you can give them uh, this uh, a task of, hey, pass this date, and instead of having it go a uh, day, month, year, have it go month, day, year, right? And if you give it enough examples, GPT-3 will succeed at this task something like 99.8% of the time, but it will fail 0.2% of the time, um, which shows that it is, it is succeeding enough that it kind of understands the task, but it's not thinking about the task in a systematic way. So the other weakness of these models is that they cost a fortune to run. Like they're very, very expensive. And here again, most is going to be on your side. It's always going to be more expensive to, run, to, to use a large language model to uh, pass a date than it is to run a piece of code. So I, I think we're like in this very interesting time right now where like nobody really knows how these things will shake out. But I think that, again, these AIs will learn how to use tools. And I think that on some level, they will be small enough to discriminate to understand, hey, is this a task that I expect to perform a lot? Is this a task that I am performing a lot right now? And is this a task that benefits from more systematic thinking? If so, I'm going to write a piece of code to perform this task for me because it's going to be cheaper and more reliable and more systematic. And you think that the model will know that, or is it the human guides it to saying, okay, this is not a good use of the model? I, I think there are ways to build systems that always are part of the model or upstream of the model such that the model would, would in a way, know that. I actually think that the sort of engineering is like lagging way behind of the capability. It's just, fe- it's kind of frustrating to me because like I'm working on Raflet, working really hard to build uh, some LLM into, into Raflet uh, capability. So we have the Ghostwriter product. But I feel like we're all scratching the surface. Like there's so much to do. I think tool usage is possible today. It's possible to build a chat GPT that has a Python interpreter on the side, that has a search engine on the other side, but nobody's really built it. So I, I think it is possible today to ask it a question like, book me a flight and uh, it going to kind of Google, whatever, and then maybe writing a program, hitting an API and booking you a flight. I think that's totally possible today. Bounties and the reason why we started thinking about the world th- this way is that I'm actually like sort of a crypto canon, but um, the sovereign individual uh, had a description in it that talks about the sort of the future of work in a way. And it, it talks about how AI, crypto, sort of the future of the internet would support this sort of world where people are less full-time employed. They're more like freelancers. They're able to jump from work to work. They're able to construct companies on the fly and kind of dissolve them right after the work is done. And um, and, and th- th- that's been the picture in my mind for a long time. 
And I think for the first time, it's really possible. All these technologies are maturing in a way that allows this new crop of entrepreneurs to be able to be hyper productive and be able to get things done super quickly and super cheaply. You know, when we talk to uh, younger programmers, like almost without fail, their ambition is no longer to join Microsoft or Facebook or, or whatever. They, they, they want to build businesses. They want to make money. They want to go into freelancing. They want to be like this free spirit. They want to build uh, a career that is like freedom maximizing. Um, and I, I, th I think having the ability to use sort of uh, an army of AI assistants and you know, being really powered, supercharged by this technology will give people uh, amazing opportunities um, in the future. Yeah, I, I think that just like the PC was a, a tool of, of sort of great individual empowerment, I think you're right that AI is going to give even more leverage to the individual. I think like code let companies like WhatsApp sell for like 20 billion with like, I think like 40 or 50 people. I think you're right. I think we're going to see 1 billion, 10 billion, maybe 1 trillion dollar company in, you know, a decade or so, uh, uh, with perhaps one or two people. I totally agree with that. Man, if you pay software engineers by the ticket, I think you would see a lot fewer rest investors and you would actually see 10x engineers making 10x the salary. I think if you really believe in a 10x engineer, which I do, uh, I think you should see software engineers make $10 million a year at, at big companies and you don't see that. And conversely, you see uh, people who might call uh, professional coffee bribers uh, who just rest and invest and who make 500k uh, a year packages. Um, so I'm very excited by the potential here. I think that's totally not going to work, by the way. By the way, the bounty system is one of the parts of Web3 that totally doesn't fucking work. There's entire companies that are based around bounties and those infra companies that are based around paying someone a bounty to do a thing are always like the ones that you have to like route around and somehow use the product without it. I mean, think about it. Do you pay anybody in your company in bounties? No. Would you? Would a 10x engineer who actually wants to make like generational wealth, we're talking $100 million exits, would they sit there and do basically mechanical Turk for coding all day? Or would they actually, I mean, you're, you're creating a, an, arbitra an arbitrary binary duality between rest investors and people working like coding chipmunks on, on bounties, right? But the reality is that most coders who make lots of wealth, it's neither one nor the other, right? It's people who actually do work their asses off, but it's with some sort of committed product in which they have an overarching design ethos, right? Google uh, needs 120,000 employees, and most of them are uh, just like making lattes every day. They're really good at making lattes. But at, at a drop of the hat, they would need them, and they would find them there. And there's very low friction on using their labor and their talents, right? So it's a very rational behavior to sort of hoard talent. Uh, it's sort of like the billionaire that has all these assistants. You're like, oh, they're just sitting around doing nothing. But at the drop of the hat, when something important happens, he needs all that labor and he can't really hire it from the market at large. So anytime uh, technology reduces the cost of going to the market, you see us going to the market more. Again, people had a lot more drivers and personal drivers before Uber uh, came around. And now everyone has uh, access to the market at a very low transaction cost. And, and, and that's the same across the board. Like anything that you use today that you find, you know, very useful, like DoorDash, people used to have people that worked with them for them. Like people had servants that were around all day, just waiting for that one order of the day to go get that. And now you're able to go to the market and get that labor on demand on the fly, right? So I, th I think uh, bounty type systems, and I think crypto uh, as well, could uh, allow us to work on some coordination problems in order to uh, solve the transaction cost. So you can have like, you know, hundreds of uh, coders at any given point working for you so that you can focus on building like a billion dollar idea, right? So some way to, you know, pay people for their contribution, I think is the ethical thing to do. Like the idea that, you know, b being able to pay people for the data that they create is, is not a bad idea. Like, um, you know, if we can trace the op the Wikipedia contributions on a character by char or a token by token level that gets fed into GPT, and a hypothetical company in the future that wants to do the right thing would assign some kind of hypothetical value per token, and they can just like pay out some revenue share to the authors of the uh, of the data that they were uh, trained on, 
or maybe the data that gets used in, in production. For people listening to this who want to join AI companies or want to invest in AI companies, what are the kinds of AI companies that are going to be enduring versus the kinds of companies that are going to be commodities and not capture a lot of value? I, I, I view three categories of companies that operate right now, right? There's like what they call like big model, right? So it's like, like anthropic open AI that creates these giant models. Um, then there's the application layer on top of those, and the application layer is going to be made of, um, I'll, I'll just uh, arbitrarily slice it as like horizontal applications and vertical applications. Um, the mode for the large language models is going to be economies of scale, meaning it costs a fortune to build uh, large language models. It's costing more and more money. Um, you know, I think GPT-4 is going to cost of the order of, call it 100 mil to train uh, between the results cost and the compute. It, it's very, very expensive, which is why OpenAI is raising all that money, plus the label to train it using RLHF, as Amjad described. So it's just very expensive to train, but that's a one-time cost. And then the inference cost, meaning the, the cost that it costs to run the AI once you've trained it, uh, is many orders of magnitude lower. So again, if you think of $100 million to train the AI, running it is more on the order of one cent. I mean, you're right, Flo. We've, we've already saw that with Google, for example, right? I mean, the reason why Google is as good as it is is not because they're AI is so amazing, although no, no doubt it is, because they have literally the entire world typing what they want, right? It was always the data set. It was never the actual algorithm. Algorithms aren't particularly defensible, right? At the end of the day, AI isn't a product any more than literary regression is, right? You actually have to apply it to something to create something that someone will pay you for, right? And that's where I kind of don't quite get a little bit of the AI hype, right? It's like, um, like where is the actual product? If Google can't actually find a way to turn that into actual cash, and a lot of these companies are actually basically thinly veiled, just prompt you eyes on ChatGPT. What is the actual product? The right. production is not expensive. Production of text and production of music and production of, of images has not been well devalued. You can hire folks on Pivot to do these things. You're not Pivot. But like, you can hire folks to do these things just fine and you're still not going to go anywhere, right? So the value is in the distribution. So I think that if generative AI is going to change anything to the structure of the industry is that anytime you make anything cheaper, its complements become more valuable. So here we're making content cheaper not that it was really necessary because it was all pretty cheap. Uh, and so the complement to content, which is distribution, is going to become more valuable. So I actually think that this, this is going to be great for TikTok and YouTube and all of that. All knowledge work will be automated in the next 20 years. Uh, and so I think, again, code is the first one that was being automated. That's, uh, I think, huge. I think we're going to see a lot more come out in the next two years, uh, which are going to see action-oriented knowledge work that actually does stuff, I think is going to be automated pretty soon. I expect support if it's going to be a pretty big one. When you think about it, all the knowledge work there is, is it's a function that sits in between a keyboard and a monitor. And I think AI is going to be really good at approximating that function. But just to be clear, you're saying that all knowledge work will be replaced in 20 years? We've been hearing that for 20 years. And in fact, if there's any bit of skepticism around AI, like skept, you know, AI being at the, like the very pivot of like changing everything, I at least have been hearing that since I've been in tech. And if you go back even further back, Marvin Minsky in the 60s and 70s has been saying the same thing, which is why I was sort of trying to quantify what is the, the change that we're seeing? Because again, there's clearly a trend line, like no doubt, obviously, AI and automation have changed lots of things. I'm not saying it hasn't been a big deal. I'm just trying to understand if we actually are at some sort of clear, like real inflection point, or are we continuing along the same trend line, which already, by the way, I think is a big deal, right? Like, I mean, what I cited, right, going from the Kernigan and Richies of the world to Replit, there's been, <laughs> there's been a big change, right? Like, I, I'm not trying to underwhelm it, but it's it's... It's not quite AGI, Terminator, end of the world levels of change. When something is not able to do a task, it just can't do the task. But we're now hitting that moment where across very broad sets of tasks, the best AIs are outperforming the average human. They're not yet at the level of the expert human in any specific domain. They can outperform employed college grads on very wide distributions of tasks to a big bench. Big bench is a big benchmark that uh, that they compared Palm to this like pool of, you know, kind of software QA testers, essentially. And AI won. I don't know. I like this is the same discord I heard about when Big Blue defeated, um, you know, Kasparov at, at chess. I mean, it, it's, it's the exact same feeling. I mean, in times like this, right, I, I think a little I think a lot of this is actually intellectual narcissism, on the part of humans. Who are, who are assigning a certain anthropic value to computers thinking. And, and I think of the, um, the famous Dijkstra's quote, right? Again, we've been debating these questions for decades before any of us were alive. Right? And, he was, and he commented that asking whether a computer can think is like asking whether a submarine can swim, right? It, it doesn't matter. The point is that it does 40 knots and a human does one knot, right? 
And so along that particular dimension, which is moving through the water, the computer actually does do better than the human. And when it comes to ranking ads or you know filtering through Stack Overflow and coming up with a net result, clearly the computer does better, but that's very different than saying that it's more intelligent and this causes a crisis in the knowledge economy. The generality of LLMs can't be understated. Like for the first time, they can learn your intent from just one example. I can build Google Translate, Antonio, in three seconds. I'll just say English, hello, French, salut. And then I can say English, home, and then I'll continue the, the French word. It's, it's sort of like, that's pretty freaking amazing. I, I, that hasn't happened before. In any time we have a jump in generality, like the last time was the Turing machine, is it, it, sort of an enormous thing. I think every app will get better. And I, I think actually the biggest beneficiaries of this shift is going to be sort of a growth stage startups. And the reason is because you got distribution, but Flo talked about distribution. So Notion adding AI is much more interesting than a new sort of knowledge management that's like based on, uh, that's like AI first. So let's call it bearish on AI first uh, uh, companies. Uh, usually bullish on AI infrastructure companies. So uh, OpenAI or anyone really building dev tools around prompts, prompt IDEs, building fine tuning sort of uh, technology. Anyone who's who wants who, who are making it easier to build with transformer uh, models, that, that's going to be something that every company will buy. Because again, I think it's a diffused technology similar to the cloud. Like every company will integrate this kind of technology into their so. You know, the financial sort of answer to your question is that if you want to invest in it, probably do do another FANG type strategy, because I think there's another set of S curve there. Plus, maybe inv invest in infrastructure like NVIDIA, whatever. And then on the startup side, dev tools, uh, AI intelligence layer like OpenAI, uh, th those are sort of the beneficiaries. And maybe the growth stage startups, early growth stage like us or or Notion, or, or things like that will benefit a lot from this. The Cognitive Revolution podcast is supported by OmniKey. OmniKey is an omni-channel creative generation platform that lets you launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with the click of a button. OmniKey combines generative AI and real-time advertising data to generate personalized experiences at scale. Oh, 